So many of you might have already seen uh, my lectures in the past online through SSFTV. Um, what I like to do every year is kind of give you an update of some of the changes that are occurring in neurostimulation. Uh, my time for these uh, lectures seems to be getting shorter and shorter every single year, so I'll go relatively quickly uh, and just really give you not even a 30,000 foot overview, but like really a 40,000 foot overview now that we have so many spaceships going into uh, the stratosphere. So a little bit about me, Glenn already mentioned, I'm in Larkspur or uh, Marin County, just north of San Francisco in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, probably the biggest new change for me is that I'm the president of the Pacific Spine and Pain Society in the last year. And I'll talk a little bit about that society and how you guys can get involved. The awesome thing about it is it's free, <laughs> so you should definitely get involved. Uh, and it's really a unique society that bridges uh, spine surgery and interventional pain management. So it's a good opportunity for you. And that's where our practice is. If you know where the Golden Gate Bridge is, we're about five to six miles just north on the 101. All right, so my disclosures, I work with a lot of different people, as you can see. Uh, the big reason for that is uh, when I was a, a you know, resident here at UW in Seattle, um, I was not thinking about pain management at all. I thought I would do critical care for sure. Uh, you heard about my background in uh, nosocomial infections from the World Health Organization. I really thought that was gonna be my way forward. Uh, and a lot of people were trying to dissuade me from doing pain management, but I saw it for what it was going to be, not what it was. And I knew at that time, opioids were not gonna be the answer, steroids were gonna be the answer. We have a lot of technologies that we're developing, we're continuing to develop, and that are really gonna make a difference in people's lives. Uh, and we're still not there. Uh, Doug's a big part of that, so I love uh, doing these courses with him because he's always in the know about the latest and greatest. And it's really cool from my perspective to help shape those things um, from a safety, therapy, and cost effectiveness standpoint. So the table of contents for today, I'm gonna to go through a brief history, go through the safe principles, which I think everybody should know, uh, not only for neurostimulation, but for any new technology, go through uh, the evidence, very high level, talk a little bit about the vendors and gross comparisons since you guys are exposed to your own vendors depending on where you guys are training. Uh, it's really important as a fellow, you guys see as much as you can. If your institution just uses company A or company B, make sure you reach out to company C and D because you gotta learn all of that stuff before you go out in the real world. We'll go through some of the, where, where you can find the guidelines for neurostimulation, talk briefly about the societies and the millions of them that there are, and then tracking outcomes, which I think is a really important thing. And, and Neil and Doug can talk quite a bit about what they're doing to track outcomes for certain technologies. So the birth of neurostimulation, uh, certainly, you know, we've been talking about it going thousands of years with some of the, the electric fish that were put on people's bodies. But as far as the concept that you are familiar with now, the placement of epidural leads and paddles and perk leads and IPGs, that concept began in 1967 in Wisconsin, La Crosse, Wisconsin. It was a neurosurgeon by the name of Norm Sheely who uh, basically took the idea of the gate control theory, uh, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, and thought to himself, well, gee, and his group, what if we applied electrical current to the spinal cord, which is really the super highway of peripheral nociception, and see what happens? And so in this case of a patient who is basically nearing end of life uh, with terminal cancer, uh, they actually put those leads, as you can see right in this picture, directly onto the dura uh, and sutured it on uh, the spinal cord. Unfortunately, this patient passed away just a few days later, uh, but they were able to uh, see what happened. It wasn't from a complication of the device itself. The patient did report uh, good pain relief. And that's really the beginning of it. Interestingly, uh, Norm tried to get this in neurosurgical journals, none accepted it, and so it went to anesthesia and analgesia, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. And then in the next several years, uh, there was, you know, obviously that was a pretty invasive, uh, radical idea and technology for that time period. Again, gate control theory, 1965. So it's really amazing that the application of a theory uh, really only took two years. That's, that's very unique in medicine, as you all know. Uh, then in 1971 out of Japan uh, was the use of epidural electrodes, which you're all accustomed to now. 1970, and those were single or dual electrodes in the 1970s. Then the four electrode arrays in 1978. And then finally the implantable pulse generator, the IPG, the battery you're accustomed to knowing about in your everyday practice came out in 1981. Everything before that was radio frequency powered. So external uh, generation of energy. 1986, eight electrode arrays, which you see commonly. The 1988 multi-lead IPG, so instead of just one, now you've got two, and now you guys are used to seeing four, uh, excuse me, leads in many of our IPGs. 
And then 1994, uh, rechargeable IPGs. So again, most of you are probably using rechargeable IPGs. I think there's a huge growth in primary cell or non-rechargeables in the last few years for lots of reasons we can get into. Uh, but 1994 was the beginning of that. MRI conditionality, huge deal. And all of the companies know that that's, that's really a priority. Uh, 16 electrode arrays by one of our companies, our platinum sponsor. Positional sense uh, by another one of our sponsors, the idea of adapting to the patient's position. Because as you can imagine, if you're lying down, if you're standing up, if you're sitting, the thickness of the CSF changes. And that's really the biggest resistor to the application of current to the spinal cord from the, uh, the epidural space. So the idea of adjusting the current due to position is a very good idea. And if you, and we'll talk about this later, there are some of the new technologies that employ feedback that's what really what they're dealing with, is that change in CSF distance. So uh, the idea of that really started in 2011, um, which, again, you might consider a bit archaic because it's, it's really using an accelerometer to see if you're standing, lying, or sitting. But nonetheless, you know where we're going with things in the future. 2015, uh, pivotal level one RCT, the Senza RCT, um, high frequency simulation, 10 kilohertz, kind of changed the game for us. That was our first level one study in our space, really. Um, prior level one studies looked at you know, spinal cord stimulation versus uh, spine surgery after spine surgery uh, by North, uh, which was a, an important study for spinal cord stimulation. But what, what the SENSA RCT did was justify a specific type of therapy. And then soon to follow DRG stimulation, which is a novel form uh, and target for stimulation, and then burst stimulation, uh, burst DR specifically, which followed, again, randomized control trial compared to tonic for that particular trial. 2019, uh, a different company came out with a microstimulator. Uh, 2020 remote programming, which was really heralded by the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is something that really actually enhanced our therapies because we were forced to not see patients face to face. So I remember uh, in April, uh, May of last year, my rep programming a patient from his car to their car in our parking lot because they could, we couldn't be face to face, as you guys know. Uh, and so all of the, the companies have really embraced this idea. And I mean, soon you're going to be able to, no, not now, but soon you'll be able to program somebody if they're traveling in Turkmenistan. I mean, it's getting to that level now. And then feedback systems, uh, you know, they're out there. I'm sure you've seen some of the data. Commercialization is expected next year, 2022. Yeah. All right, the safe principles. How many of you have heard the safe principles? Raise your hand. All right, just two people. All right, so this is what it stands for. Uh, think about this for any new technology, safety, appropriateness as far as the indication, fiscal neutrality. How much do these things cost? As you guys know, these devices can cost anywhere from twenty dollars to $50,000. And then efficacy, how well does it work? So think about these principles any time you're approached with a new therapy. You want to go step by step by step by step. So for neurostimulation, as far as uh, our evidence and efficacy, we have some of these major level one studies I alluded to here with the Senza RCT. The accurate trial was a level one study comparing DRG stimulation to tonic stimulation for complex regional pain syndrome and causalgia. And then the BURST study uh, in 2017 compared BURST DR, which is a proprietary form of BURST stimulation compared to tonic stimulation and, and showed benefit. This gives you a, a really, again, gross overview of all the different systems. Again, this is not totally comprehensive. Each company is going to come to you and say, we do this, we do this, we do this. And they don't do that, they don't do that, they don't do that. Um, but from my perspective, just look at the whole ocean, uh, not just the little islands that are coming at you, and just try to compare and understand. And really just open your mind to everybody, because what may not be a you know, strong company right now may leapfrog everybody else in a few years because they know that, that this is how competition works and the marketplace works. So always be friends with everybody because you never know who's going to be the biggest player uh, in the market. So MRI conditionality, um, you know, as far as what the paddle leads look like, how many contacts, the IPGs, current versus voltage was kind of an old concept. Everybody's kind of jumped onto current now. And then, you know, in the last 10 years, it's all been about waveforms and patterns. So again, they all have their own proprietary uh, magic sauce. I, I implore you to look at the evidence to understand which of these things work, but then also which of these things work for your patients. Don't be afraid to, to try different companies. You can even do trials with two different companies, uh, which is something, again, you should consider. There's some caveats to that, of course, but 
again, be open to all of these things. All right, as far as DRG stimulation, there is one FDA approved DRG stimulator um, from uh, this particular company. And uh, I'll show you a demonstration of that. This is really indicated for complex regional pain syndrome and causalgia. We're looking at focal neuropathic pain syndrome. So with spinal cord stimulation, if I had someone with foot pain, I would cross my fingers. With DRG stimulation, I know going in, I'm gonna be able to definitely get the foot. I can, I can simulate the fourth toe with DRG stimulation. That's how specific this is. So I think this is a very underutilized therapy. It's probably the most technically challenging therapy for interventional pain management physicians. Um, but when you get it in the right spot, it can absolutely change someone's life. And I have a number of stories uh, that I can share with you in the future about that. And then peripheral nerve stimulation. Um, so peripheral nerve stimulation actually predated spinal cord stimulation. If you look at that Norm Shealy article I showed you from ANA in 1967, in fact, the first introductory paragraph is about the merits of peripheral nerve stimulation. However, there were some failures uh, with specific nerves that he cites, uh, the peroneal nerve, and he states that, well, spinal cord stimulation really can uh, overcome all of those issues because you're really getting all the nerves as they go up through the spinal cord. So that really lit, led to a, sh a shift in neurostimulation. We have since really focused on spinal cord stimulation. Of course, our reimbursement is fitted such that that has been the case, but recently some changes in reimbursement and of course, some um, technological advances with ultrasound, miniaturization, et cetera, have allowed some of these other therapies to prosper. I really, again, this is one of the areas in neurostimulation that's in its infancy. It's like Tesla stock at $50. You wanna be thinking about it. The evidence isn't quite there yet. We haven't figured out all of the right indications, but we're gonna get there. So if you wanna get on the train, definitely up your ultrasound skills and up your understanding of these different technologies. Um, because again, they all have their own bells and whistles and similarly to what you saw with spinal cord stimulation where they all have their own unique aspects, it's even greater in peripheral nerve stimulation. Because if you think about spinal cord stimulation as a procedure, your goal really is get in the epidural space and get along the right area of the spinal cord. With peripheral nerve stimulation, think about all the peripheral nerves Think about the way they work, motor, sensory, parasympathetic, sympathetic. Think about the distance to the nerve, the way the lead is shaped, uh, the forms of stimulation. Then you overlay all the things you know from spinal cord stimulation, like patterns, waveforms, amplitude, all those things. This is a really complex area. Uh, but the future is bright primarily because if you're a patient, would you rather have something put into your spine or around your knee? if you have a knee pain issue. And so this is, again, uh, if you think about what patients want, like I will, I will pitch DRG stimulation all the time for patients after an arthroplasty that have chronic pain, a knee arthroplasty, but they'll say, uh-uh, you're not putting something around my spine. But you talk to them about putting leads around the genicular nerves, the femoral, saphenous, sciatic, they're like, okay, that makes more sense because those nerves are closer to my knee. So from a patient preference standpoint, invasiveness standpoint, there may be some merit here. All right, so as far as guidelines, uh, if you're not already familiar with these, I encourage you to really dig into these. I think every fellow should just have an understanding of these guidelines. Uh, they're the NAC guidelines, the Neurostimulation Appropriateness Con Consensus Committee, uh, which really took a panel of experts who do quite a bit of neurostimulation, published in neuromodulation. Uh, we also did this for DRG stimulation, and we also did this for intrathecal drug delivery. Uh, this is really a good place to start to ask those questions about infection prevention, uh, anticoagulation, antithrombosis, um, how do I surgically, you know, where should I put my pocket? All of those questions you might have are really laid out in, in an evidence consensus-based format and they'll grade the evidence and they'll say like, we don't have the evidence or we do and then go from there. And this gets updated generally every five to 10 years, uh, just depending on the energy and momentum of certain issues. And then societies. When I was a fellow, let's see, 2011, I was totally annoyed with how many societies there were, right? It's like, oh my God, you want me to pay this much money for this one and then that one? What's the difference between them and that? It's like, oh my goodness. So the, the problem and the virtue of pain is that we're a very multidisciplinary field, right? We're not functional neurosurgeons and you know which society to go to. 
Uh, we've got an interventional radiologist. We have physiatry, we have anesthesiology, we have surgeons from ortho, neuro. We've got everybody. And so how do we all congregate? Well, it's like herding cats, you know? And it, in each society really has its own shtick and some are stronger bef you know, in other years than current years. It depends on the people. That's really what it comes down to, guys. These societies are built on people and people like you. Like your energy into the societies are what make them. There are obviously certain societies like the ASA, uh, which is a huge, huge society for anesthesiologists, but pain is one small sliver of it. Uh, they are a huge uh, player at the table when it comes to reimbursement. So we've got to talk to them, but obviously their focus is on everything else, right? Critical care, OR anesthesia, OB anesthesia, everything else. So as you go forward, it's important to think about which societies you're a part of, you know, who really helps you financially, politically, et cetera. Um, but one of the reasons we created, this is a little plug here, the Pacific Spine and Pain Society is because we were really annoyed with all those other societies. We wanted a society that was really easy to get into. It's free. So join. <laughs> And we really wanted it to be educational because what we felt was missing is that education was really industry sponsored or your fellowship, and that was it. What happened after you left your fellowship? You were kind of on your own. You talk to friends, you know, you go to society meetings, but then you really didn't get what you wanted out of it. So the primary focus of PSPS is really to, again, do a lot of categoric teaching, really teach you the newest stuff. Um, and eventually we hope to be a bigger voice for reimbursement, RUC, et cetera. But at this time, it's really primarily focused on education and collaborating between spine surgery and interventional pain. Because some of the therapies, like Doug's going to show you, interspinous clamps, uh, I'm going to show you sacroiliac joint fusion, these are, these are you know, orange, red areas of contention. Uh, because these are some of the therapies that maybe spine surgeons historically have done uh, and now interventional pain is doing. Uh, another example, Vertiflex, I'll show you that. That was originally a, a, a procedure only done by surgeons. The IDE study was done by orthopedic surgeons and some neurosurgeons primarily, and now it's primarily done by interventional pain. So there is this shift uh, in what is incurring in minimally invasive spine surgeries, and we need to be able to talk to the surgeons. Like, I need to talk to Neil to say, hey, you know, is this okay with you? What do you think about the evidence? And he's gonna say, well, what if you have a complication? Do you have the surgical skill set to take care of it? Who's your backup? and then the reimbursement issues. So these are the kinds of difficult but important conversations we have to have. And again, we, we're gonna have that at PSPS, but I'm sure you'll find this in other societies. Uh, I'm a part of, or have been at least at some point, a part of every single one of these societies. So again, go to the cheapest, that's the way I rolled, <laughs> and see what's stuck, and then continue on from there. All right, and then the last little slide here, because I only have a couple minutes. Um, this is a little disjointed and tangential from the rest of the deck, but I still think it's super important, because again, we have Neil and Doug here, and, and myself included. Measure your outcomes. Where we have failed in pain medicine is really in the measuring of our outcomes. So how many epidural steroid injections do we do annually? Like thousands. And what do we depend on as far as measuring our outcomes? How many of you guys check on how those patients do afterwards? Okay, good. And, and at what time point do they come back? <laughs> Is it a week, three weeks, five weeks, six months, when the patient wants to? I mean, we can try to be good, but you guys know. It's like, if the patient feels great, they're gone. They're going to Hawaii, right? And they don't come back. So you really don't know what the outcome was. And, and what's hard right now, pre-COVID really, is you couldn't remotely get that data. So you had to depend on them coming back, you know, billing for that visit, and they were just like, yeah, fine, what's the point of this visit? It takes three minutes. Well, think about the future, guys. You know, now that telemedicine is being reimbursed, we can now get outcomes, we can have people, you know, working in reg registries for certain therapies, you can start to get these outcomes. And that is what the future is. Our payments, our reimbursement need to be pay based on our success, right? We can't just be sticking steroids in people's spines and expecting to get paid, you know, for the rest of our lives. That's not gonna work because that's not doing justice to our patients. So I encourage you to understand all of these validated measures. Think about which ones you're gonna employ. Think about which platforms, maybe these guys can tell you or I can tell you about different platforms that check these outcomes. But this is your future. If you're not doing it now, you're gonna have to. Because you, you guys know it's unethical to be doing all this stuff and not know how your patients are doing, right? You've got to know. So really, uh, if, if you haven't already done so during your fellowship, think about these things and even ask your attendings, like how do we know this patient did well after this lumbar sympathetic block? Like are we really tracking them? 
functionally? Are we just relying on NRS? Is that enough? It's not easy, it's time consuming. Patients don't like it, they don't wanna fill out all this stuff. But we gotta figure out a simple way to do it, otherwise our specialty just won't prosper like it should. So I will stop there. Um, I have five minutes before Jen does her demonstration of spinal cord stimulation, but I wanted to open up to all of you. Do you guys have any questions at all about this super high level discussion on neurostimulation or any of these topics? Yes, Neil. I'll open up with a... Uh... I'll open up with a practical question. So these fellows are uh, coming out of a protected environment. They're now going out into the community. They're now uh, standing alone. Um, what guidance can you give them on how do you set up your practice? What are essential? You, you mentioned that keep open access to different vendors so that technologies are available to you, yeah. but how do you bring the message to the community who's going to refer to you? What tips can masters give great, fellows? Great question. So uh, I think the most important thing you guys can do is understand your ecosystem wherever you go, whether it's academics, private, it's a place you know, or it's a place you don't know. You've got to know your patients, the demographics, You've got Google now. These guys, we didn't have Google. <laughs> now you can easily look up all these things. You gotta know who the physicians are in your community, who the primary care doctors are, because you're gonna have to go out and meet with them, have lunch, dinner, whatever. You're gonna have to find out who the other surgeons are in your community. Uh, so spine surgery, absolutely, when it comes to these, these therapies, uh, because they may be your referring source, but they may also back you up. They can be your best friend, they can be your worst enemy and you want them to be your best friend. We have to collaborate. If there is friction, it's going to destroy you. And frankly, it's gonna affect everything else that we're trying to achieve for the care of our patients. There are a lot of examples in medicine where friction has led to poor patient outcomes, just from a really, really high upstream level. And once that collaboration occurs, then patients benefit. I mean, good examples of that are intracardiac stents, right? Uh, in IR, I mean, they, they infringe in, in a good way on a lot of different specialties. So this is nothing new in medicine. Uh, we've got to create those relationships. And then start, start slow and humble. You know, just do what you do best well, but always have an eye on the future. I mean, if, if you're really good at opioid prescribing and steroids, don't stick with that forever, because that's not going to last. You got to understand where the evidence is with some of these therapies. And look, maybe all this stuff turns out not to be that great. And we do a sham control trial and it doesn't work. Okay, great. Well, what else is there? We've got lots of other evidence-based therapies, minimally invasive spine, et cetera, that there is a good role for you. Um, and then I would say just focus on, again, uh, relationships, community, understanding you know, the technologies, and then understanding reimbursement. I, I don't think in fellowship programs we do a really good job teaching you guys the business side of things. And if you're going to academics, a lot of people think, well, you don't have to know that stuff. The answer, actually you do. You do have to know that stuff because it affects the bottom line of your university, how much power you have, where you can hire an APP or not, uh, what they think of you and your standing, quite frankly, because business is business. We do capitalistic medicine in, in the United States of America. So that's the way it is, whether you like it or not. Um, so understand those things. You know, I, I've done a few courses on it, um, but frankly, you learn it the hard way. You learn it the hard way, you learn by not getting paid on something and you figure out, oh boy, I gotta really do better on documentation or you, and you really gotta stay on top of it because it changes every single year. So that was a long-winded answer uh, to a very good question, but I'm sure we'll sp sprinkle in more pearls throughout the day. Any other questions? All right, you guys will wake up eventually. All right, we definitely want you, you know, again, that's what we're here for. Uh, a lot of the stuff you'll see on the videos, but the questions are really what, what we want you guys focusing on. So please, uh, we're here for you. This is super informal. We're all super approachable. Ask us anything. Um, so welcome. It's kind of underattended this year on purpose because we're under a limitation about the number of people that could come. So number one, thank you for coming. And number two, you slid in under the door as it was closing. So one of the things I would like to know from you because we've got a lot of different devices. And, you know, years ago there were very few devices. Now there's lots. 
And one of the things I'd like to know from you is how much experience you have with whatever we're, we're working with. So we have, in general, peripheral nerve stimulation. We have DRG stimulation. We have spinal cord stimulation. And then there's a lot of different varieties. We have totally implantable systems. We have systems that, that have a receiver. We have transcutaneous type of stimulation, charging. And one of the real deficiencies, and I'm going to be, uh, I'd like to state this up front, is for, as a course director, program director, I know Dr. Seanard will agree with me on this, one of the real deficiencies we have with interventional pain physicians is surgical skill deficiency. My bear cup with boxer gloves comes to me every July, and it's, uh, it's quite painful for about three months until they learn the surgical skills, buying things from the grocery store to sew together, and learning just kind of basic surgical skills. And you can't really do devices like this unless you have surgical skills. Different types of suture, different types of suturing technique, different, what, what happens when you have a bleeder? I mean, when to use cautery, what, what setting it should it be on? Uh, and as we convert our practice to a minimally invasive spine fix-it shop, which is really what's slowly happening over the course of time, you'll need to add the surgical skill that's, that's helpful. And so, I'm going to introduce Dr. Jennifer Lee. She's going to do the spinal cord stimulation.